All right, well, good morning and welcome to uh, the Kennedy Space Center, America's premier multi-user spaceport. It is absolutely great here today, getting ready for uh, Boeing's commercial crew launch of the Starliner. Uh, I, can't, I can't say enough good things about what we're doing here at KSC. I, I think it's pretty amazing when you look out at all that's going on. But today's focus is on getting crews back to the International Space Station on a U.S. rocket. And today we've got our NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, Deputy Administrator Jim Moorhead, and this awesome Boeing commercial crew cadre, Jeff Casada, Sonny Williams, Nicole Mann, Mike Fink, and of course Boeing's uh, test pilot astronaut Chris Ferguson. So without further ado, I want to bring the NASA Administrator up here and let's get going. Jim? Thank you, Bob. Well, thank you all for being here today. And Bob, um, you're just doing an amazing job here at the Kennedy Space Center. I remember it wasn't too long ago it was announced that the space shuttles were going to retire. Uh, the Constellation program was going to be canceled. And of course, here at the Space Coast in Central Florida, uh, there was a lot of concerns and a lot of families were hurting. But Bob, because of your leadership and the great things you've done, you've transformed this facility into a multi-user spaceport where we've got commercial activities happening side by side with government activities. And I'll tell you, we have more under development right now than at any point in NASA's history. We have two commercial crew programs that are under development. And of course, we've got our, our big program, which is going back to the moon under the title Artemis, where we're gonna send the first woman and the next man to the South Pole of the Moon within five years. Um, these are very exciting times for the Kennedy Space Center, very exciting times for Central Florida. But like Bob said, today we're talking about the Boeing Starliner and this event that's going to happen tomorrow, this big test flight. And I just want to kind of set the stage for a lot of people to understand what we're doing here. We're moving into a new era. We are going to, in fact, launch American astronauts on American rockets from American soil for the first time since the retirement of the space shuttles. And we're going to do that in the first part of next year. But we're doing it in a way that's never been done before. This time when we go, we're going to go with commercial partners. NASA is not purchasing, owning, and operating the hardware. We're buying a service. The goal being that NASA wants to be one customer of many customers in a very robust commercial marketplace for human spaceflight in the future. We also want to have numerous providers that compete against each other on cost and innovation. The ultimate goal being we want to drive down costs, increase innovation, and increase access to space in a way that we've never seen before. And this test flight tomorrow by the Boeing Starliner is the next step in this mighty vision that got started a long time ago. But we're getting closer and closer and by early next year we're going to be launching American astronauts on American rockets from American soil again for the first time since the retirement of the space shuttles back in 2011. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our representative for this effort, uh, our, one of our great astronauts, Mike Fink. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. And uh, I'm here to give the uh, astronaut perspective this morning, and uh, we're excited. Uh, uh, compliments uh, also to uh, um, Mr. Cabana. This is a really cool multi-user spaceport. And we crew, we're uh, looking forward to uh, commercial infrastructure into space because this means more flight assignments for us, which is what astronauts really you know, live for. But it's also more flight assignments uh, for the non-government astronaut types. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a really uh, interesting time. And this, uh, and like our administrator said, is uh, this is, uh, we're building the, the infrastructure to low Earth orbit, and NASA's gonna go uh, to the moon and, and beyond. Uh, so that means we have three spacecraft that we're working on right now, and as flight testers, all of us are flight testers here, this is, uh, this is a dream come true. Uh, very rarely does it come uh, where you get a, a brand new spacecraft uh, to, to go look at and test, and we have three of them right now. Of course, we have Orion with the Artemis program. Uh, we have the Starliner, which uh, we're here to talk about today, and uh, the SpaceX's uh, Crew Dragon. Uh, so we're, we're very busy right now. Uh, the OFT mission tomorrow, which is the orbital flight test, is uh, really important to us. We're sending it up without a crew. Uh, uh, we have Rosie on board. I hope you know about Rosie. She's pretty tough. Uh, she's going to take the hit for us. And we're going to look at the spacecraft and see if, if, if 
the Starliner can handle the, the rigors of, of launch uh, going from zero to 17,500 miles an hour? Can it automatically you know, fly in space and, and autonomously dock to the International Space Station? Uh, this, these uh, automatic dockings are, are something that's uh, a little bit uh, new for American technology, and uh, we think the Boeing Vesta system is going to do fantastic. And then after uh, docking to the space station, we got our, our wonderful space station crew on board. They're going to uh, take out the, the cargo. I hear there's a few uh, holiday presents, but don't tell anybody. And uh, then we're going to uh, and, and then we're going to close the hatch and uh, and undock automatically and uh, land uh, in in New Mexico. And does does the Starliner work? What are uh, what are the systems that need to be tweaked for the next mission? This is this is exciting time. This is what we live for. This is how we make uh, aviation safe. This is how we make space uh, space flights safe. So we, as the uh, as the uh, crew flight test, which is the next uh, Starliner mission, myself, uh, uh, Chris Ferguson, and Nicole Mann, uh, we're we're anxiously watching it. We're here for the launch. We'll be in mission control for the docking and on orbit portion, and then we'll be uh, we'll be there for landing and uh, watching the the parachutes open and and see uh, a beautiful soft landing on airbags in uh, in New Mexico. Very exciting times. And of course, the crew behind us. We have uh, you know. Uh, uh, Sonny Williams and Josh Casada, they're uh, they're uh, they're watching too. They're going to be the first operational mission. There's something where you go different from uh, uh, a a flight test to operations. So we're looking forward to the the launch tomorrow. The weather's looking good, and uh, we're excited uh, for the OFT orbital flight test mission and uh, go Starliner, go Atlas. I'm supposed to say uh, now it's time for questions. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, please direct your questions to a specific, uh, specific, and we'll come uh, person, and we'll come up and uh, do our best to answer. Thank you. Um, hello, this is Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press for Chris Ferguson. Um, when you landed aboard the shuttle, here we are. When we la when you landed aboard the shuttle in 2011, did you ever imagine it would take nearly nine years for humans to be launching from here again? And how important is it to close that gap from a national pride and uh, prestige uh, standpoint? Thank you. So to answer your first question, not in a million years, but I wish I had a quarter for every time somebody asked me. Uh, it, uh, I, th this is an incredibly unique opportunity. Uh, I, I recall after we landed uh, STS-135 that you know my my days of flying in space were over. Uh, of course, um, I think uh, history would indicate you know Boeing uh, was looking for some experience to come and, and help them with the commercial crew program, and uh, it was just an opportunity that was far too good to pass up to have a chance to not only. Uh, perhaps fly one more time, but to also have uh, an impact into the way that the vehicle designed and, and was operated. So very, very exciting. Um, and to the administrator's point about what does this really mean for the country, uh, it's been a long time. It's been eight and a half years, uh, far too long in my opinion. Uh, but here we are right on the threshold of getting ready to do it, not one, but, but two companies. Uh, and opportunities uh, abound not only for our NASA customers, whom we call them, but also for other potential uh, customers who might come from any walk of life, who might be involved with a country that is not a United States country. So it's very interesting here as we sit on uh, the threshold of a, of a new business. And we're counting on, you know, to co coin an old phrase, if we build it, will they come? I would like to believe the answer is yes, and this is our first demonstration. So, uh, and I'd like you all to enjoy the launch tomorrow. It's going to be spectacular. Love to see these winds die down a little bit. Though. Thank you. Hi, Irene Fouts with Aviation Week and Space Technology for Mr. Bridenstine. Um, Boeing and SpaceX are both uh, skilled and accomplished companies, and yet it's taken nine years to get to this point since the CC Dev One program started all this. Um, what uh, what are your options for trying to have this development time for a lunar human u lunar lander, especially since it now looks like your 1.6 billion supplement ask is going to be cut to 600 million? Yeah, so um, I think we can learn a lot from this program. Um, and yes, it has taken longer than anticipated. It's also true that it might not have been as as funded as we originally thought that it was going to be funded. So. Um, if, if we set forward plans with a certain budget and then we don't get the budget, of course, it takes longer for the development. 
Um, and of course, that's a risk for the moon as well. We are not immune to the same risks when we go to the moon. And I, I talk frequently about there being multiple risks when you're doing these kind of programs. But, but the two most salient risks are the technical risk, um, but then there's also the, the, the political risk. Um, so, you know, we have, to, we have to think about when we go to the moon this time, um, we want to learn all the great lessons that we've learned, not just from commercial crew, but also commercial resupply, and apply those lessons to the future. One of the lessons is uh, we now know that, that, that when we have uh, NASA as a consumer rather than the owner and the operator of the hardware, uh, we can actually maintain costs in a much in a much more um, in a much better way. We don't get the cost overruns that we have with with cost plus programs. We have two uh, competing entities that are interested in in moving forward quickly and being the first. And this this results, I think, in good outcomes for the American taxpayer. And we want to replicate that as much as possible at the moon, which is one of the reasons when we go to the moon this time, we're not going to purchase, own, and operate the hardware again. Uh, we're going to go with, with uh, basically commercial suppliers. So NASA is going to be the customer. Who can take our astronauts from the gateway down to the surface of the moon and back to the gateway for a fee? And driving down those costs is either architectural, you know, kind of things that we need to develop, reusability um, and, and other things, but also making sure that we have multiple providers that are competing against each other on cost and innovation um, and that NASA is a customer. But we also want to make sure that there are other customers. Um, and so we want to apply the lessons that we've learned from commercial resupply and commercial crew, apply them uh, for the, the human landing system. Um, and it is true, uh, we asked for, you know, a billion dollars for the human landing system. We got 600 million for the human landing system. So now we've got to go back um, and see what we need to adjust. I will also say um, that we have opportunities because this, that we, like I said, we've got five years. And right now we're working through the 2021 budget. Um, and based on what we just got in the 2020 budget, we might need to change the 2021 budget. And so working through that with our partners at the National Space Council and the Office of Management and Budget, um, we, you know, we have to start really looking at how 2021 is going to shape up as well. So um, these, are, these are challenges that we need, to, we need to work through. But remember this. When we go to the moon now, we have to remember, we have not had, for the first time since Apollo, we have hundreds of millions of dollars allocated to a human landing system that got strong bipartisan support in both the House and in the Senate. That has not happened since Apollo. We're talking about hundreds of millions, $600 million in the first year for a human landing system, and of course we've got years to come. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a milestone that should not be dismissed from the political perspective, and we're grateful. We're grateful for the bipartisan support, and we need to keep it moving forward. Thanks. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. For Chris and Sonny, um, historically there have been uh, the astronauts who have been involved in designing the spacecraft and those who would go to fly on it have added personal touches of their own, um, naming the spacecraft or signing the ID plate or other traditions. Has there been any personal touches to this spacecraft by either of you or your fellow crewmates? Thanks, Robert. You know, um, there are traditions with spaceflight, and we are working on establishing some of our traditions. Of course, you know, flying on shuttle, we had traditions in crew quarters. With the spacecraft names, there's traditions. With the Russian space program, there's traditions. So we're working on that, and uh, I think those will be a little bit of a surprise coming up in the future. But we're working on some names for the spacecraft. You know, it's near and dear to Josh and my heart, this one that you're seeing on the launch pad right now, because. You know, it's got to launch successfully and come back to Earth successfully, so uh, the next people that get into it as we get Rosie out will be Josh, myself, and two of our international partners. So uh, this spacecraft means a lot to us, and we'll, we'll be looking at giving it a name before too long. Thanks for the question. So uh, Sonny sort of, uh, I think, gave a little bit of a, a hint there. Uh, we have been... Uh, working on a couple names, and uh, I think it would be great if we could let Sonny and Josh sort of lend their desires to perhaps what their spacecraft is named. And and uh, I would have to say that they are personal touches, so uh, I think you'll uh, probably hear a little bit more about that in the not-too-distant future. Um, and as far as other uh, personal touches, you know, th this is a great team, and we realize that we're 
you know, right at the beginning of what we hope will be a very long and successful program, and, and with every cool program comes really cool traditions. Uh, I know that uh, historically, after shuttle launches were successful, we had some beans. I think you'll see a tradition or two that will come out that will uh, be a little personal to Boeing and a little personal to me. So pretty excited about that. I won't reveal that. And that's for the Boeing team. So we are working on uh, how the traditions evolve. Um, I'm not saying that we're going to do anything interesting like pull over to the side of the road in our crew transfer van. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but this is an opportunity. The, the slate is very clean, and I think you're going to see some fun things come out of it. Jeff Faust of Space News, question for the administrator. Uh, commercial crew has been talked about as a key factor in NASA's larger LEO commercialization strategy to enable uh, increased access to the station and, and part of uh, broadening the user base for the ISS and, and future commercial space station. How is that strategy going to be impacted by the FY20 budget, which only gives the agency a small fraction of the $150 million that requested for LEO commercialization? Yeah, so there's a number of things that need to happen when it comes to low Earth orbit commercialization in general. Uh, here's, what, here's what we all know. We all know that the International Space Station cannot last forever. Um, you know, of course, there's a bill in the House and a bill in the Senate uh, that extend the International Space Station to 2030. Um, and, 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 you know, that would be meaningful. But it's also important to remember that what happens after 2030. And so we need to be planning today to make sure we don't have a gap in low Earth orbit, similar to like we've been having now with launching humans from American soil now for eight and a half years. We've had a gap in an ability to launch American astronauts from American soil on American rockets. We do not want to have a gap when it comes to having humans in orbit. Um, and, and if the International Space Station goes away without something that comes after it, that's going to be, that's going to be a problem. It'll be another gap. So we've got to make sure that doesn't happen. So there's, there's a number of things that we have to do. We have to look at the demand side. And on the demand side, we're talking about experiments that result in commercialization of activities. The two lines of effort, and I know, Jeff, you've heard me talk about this a lot, the two lines of effort are um, advanced materials and industrialized biomedicine. And when we do these experiments, remember what the International Space Station is as a national laboratory. It, it, is, a, it is a limited resource. And so when we do scattershot you know, kind of missions that are experiments that are important basic research but don't result in commercialization, uh, sometimes that's not the way to optimize a follow-on space station. We need to create the demand so that, there, so that people want to build commercial space stations in the future. So industrialized biomedicine, compounding of pharmaceuticals and microgravity, creating immunizations, um, Printing of human organs in 3D, these are experiments that are happening right now on the International Space Station. Those, I think, are lines of effort for which there will be uh, great hope in the future for commercialization. On the advanced material side, we talk about you know, the idea of creating an artificial retina with advanced materials in a way that you cannot do in the gravity well of Earth. We, we talk about um, maybe Z-Blan or fiber optics, uh, creating very pristine fiber optics so that those would be materials that would be valuable here on Earth. So we need to think about what are the breakthrough capabilities that can be done in a microgravity environment that will be transformational for human life on Earth. And if we can advance those capabilities to where there's a commercialization capability down the road, um, then we're going to see a lot of private sector money. And this goes straight to your question, Jeff. We're going to need the private companies uh, to invest knowing what's going to happen in the future. And in order to get private companies to invest, NASA needs to be using the International Space Station for those activities that result ultimately in commercial demand for human access to low Earth orbit. So that's what we need to be focused on right now uh, on the International Space Station. Separately from that, we have to have the supply. And there is going to be a day when the replacement to the International Space Station is commercial space stations. I said stations because we want, we'd like to see half a dozen different space stations in orbit. We'd like to see more. <laughs> um, and, and so in order to achieve that, um, NASA will be a tenant customer for a long time. But, but we want to be a customer. That's the big difference. We want, we want private industry offsetting the cost for these activities. Um, and so there's two things that have to happen. We've got to create the demand, and we have to create the supply. And that supply originally is going to be NASA 
um, using, using that as a service, just like we did with commercial resupply, just like we're about to do with commercial crew. NASA needs to be the tenant customer and then ultimately be able to um, have commercial industry step up in a much bigger way. Um, but it, this is, it's public-private partnerships, Jeff. That's what it all comes down to. We've got to make sure that NASA um, is not doing this alone uh, and, that, and that we are setting the stage for a much broader, uh, a much broader activities in low-Earth orbit. Hi, Ken Kramer for uh, Space Up Close and Rocket Stem. First, thank you all for doing this, and good luck uh, on Friday. My question is for the three experienced crew members, Chris, Mike, and, and Suni. You've been up at the ISS before. There's a lot of changes. There's a lot more science capabilities now. I'm a scientist. I'd like to know, from your perspective, what do you hope to accomplish, not just personally, but scientifically from each of you, when you go on this mission and for Chris and, and Mike, you're going to be on a, a longer duration mission, I think, if you could tell us maybe how long it might be, six months, because the seats on the Soyuz are running out, and we really need you guys to be up there. Thank you. So, yeah, this will be my uh, third mission, uh, long duration mission to the space station, and, and uh, not all of us are lucky enough to get that many chances to go to fly uh, aboard the space station. And the reason I'm excited is because I love the uh, space station. Uh, Colonel Cabana and his crew, they took the first pieces up the space station and we got it started. And Bob, since then, we've been uh, building bigger and the space station is, is uh, fulfilling the dreams and the visions that we had for it. Uh, Sunny, of course, uh, uh, she, uh, she's been aboard space station twice and uh, we're, uh, we're looking forward to her to uh, take uh, the reins from us. And Chris, uh, he came up to visit the space station uh, when I was commander of space station on Expedition 18. It was November 2008. He brought us Thanksgiving dinner. And I uh, hope to spend another Thanksgiving maybe with you up in space. If not, we'll do Halloween or whatever holiday you choose. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so the space station has been, uh, we've been focusing on, on science. And what's really neat about the commercial crew program is that we add an extra person to the sp station crew. And that's not just uh, another, you know, uh, so instead of three uh, uh, USOS uh, American kind of crew members, we, got a, we add another one. And that one adds more than just another 25% to, to, uh, to, the, to the mix. We'll be able to focus on science even more. And what we've been learning about in, in biomedical research all the way from uh, the development of uh, new pharmaceuticals, new medicines to help people, uh, and how uh, bones change in space. And with our rodent research program, uh, we've been able to really uh, 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 change how we look at uh, life here on planet Earth. And then we add uh, this uh, potential for the 3D organ printing. That's, uh, that's, gonna that's a game changer when it works out. And we've got to figure out how to make it work. And then finally, with the material science, it's uh, just uh, uh, super exciting because uh, crystals grow differently without gravity. And that's a, what Space Station is starting to, to bring back uh, to, to planet Earth, is to make life better here. And there's commercial opportunities, uh, as the administrator is saying, they're just starting to be realized. And there's a lot of people that are going to make a lot of money by investing in space. And uh, that's the American way. So we're looking forward to it. Uh, Chris, Sonny, anything to add? Uh, I think Mike really talked about a lot of the amazing science that's going on. I mean, when we when we started, we were just building that space station, and then the science just sort of grew, and now it's getting really amazing. And it's it has to do with exploration and taking that next step and providing some of the you know the results that we've accomplished on the space station, putting that into our next programs. But for me personally, since we'll we'll have one of the first operational missions to the space station, I'm really excited to highlight our technology advancements. What we can really do here is, is American companies and Americans putting our, you know, our minds and hearts and our innovation together with these new spacecraft, which are leaps and bounds uh, better and more technological and safer than shuttle and Soyuz that I've flown in the past. It's really going to be fun to see the faces of our international partners join us and have them trust us like we trust the Russians to have taken us to the space station for a number of years. It's that cooperation, I think, which I'm looking forward to. So uh, just very quickly, in addition to having a chance to shake Spanky's hand uh, back in 2008, uh, we also, uh, on that mission, that's STS-126, brought up the whole water purification system. And uh, for, uh, for 11 years now, uh, we've been uh, turning yesterday's coffee into tomorrow's coffee very successfully. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I always, uh, I've, I've been very fond of the technology. I think it's things like this 
that are going to get us uh, safely back and forth to the moon, back and forth to Mars, and enable a long duration presence for humans well outside of low Earth orbit. And I uh, hope to learn a lot. I know there's a lot going on up there with perhaps a new amine bed scrubber, I believe it's what it's called. And uh, I, uh, I'm looking forward to sort of dabbling back into the water business again. Um, so that's what I'm looking forward to. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a utility player on the crew. Was not anticipating a, a six month stay, but I am going to use my services uh, wherever they are needed to further any science that is uh, taking place on station today. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Dan Billow at WESH-TV. Question for the administrator. Uh, why will taxpayers spend so much more for a seat on a Boeing Starliner uh, as compared to a seat on a SpaceX Dragon? So to, to, to start, and this is, this is an important point, your question is evidence that this program is working because people are now comparing prices and everybody is trying to drive those prices down. The real question is, would you prefer to spend the money with a company in the United States of America, or would you prefer to spend the money in Russia? I'd prefer to spend it in the United States of America. But even more importantly is this. Um, at the end of the day, again, we want a commercial robust marketplace where costs do, in fact, come down. Um, and it is also true that if you look at um, how we've done the development of these two programs, Boeing has had a very different task than what SpaceX had. Uh, SpaceX, for example, was part of commercial crew. So we spent billions of dollars helping SpaceX develop, or I should say commercial resupply. Billions of dollars helping SpaceX develop commercial resupply. And then after that was successful, that same Dragon ultimately was modified for human, human uh, flight. And so the cost to modify from commercial resupply to commercial crew was not as much as what Boeing did, basically starting from scratch and trying to meet the same timeline for commercial human spaceflight. So the costs might be a little bit different. I have seen a lot of reporting on what the cost per seat will be. I will also tell you NASA has not negotiated what the cost per seat will be, so I don't know where a lot of these numbers are coming from. But at the end of the day, the, the, the two solution sets really are not very comparable given where each partner started from. But the important thing is we need two independent solutions. We need dissimilar redundancy. We have seen what we saw what happened in 1986 when the, when the space shuttle Challenger exploded. We were without access to space at all, not just on the NASA side, but also on the DOD side. Dissimilar redundancy is critically important. NASA needs it. NASA decided we're going to have it. And that's what we've got with these two separate commercial crew providers. Um, but I would also say that over the course of time, I think we're going to see these costs come down. Um, and the question, as I said, the question that you just asked is why this program is already proving to be successful. Hi, Chelsea Goad with Space.com. Um, my question is for the astronauts, um, kind of a two-parter. Uh, you know, obviously everyone's extremely excited for tomorrow's launch, and I'm curious, you know, looking forward to actually flying on Starliner, you know, how you all feel now and how you expect to feel in the morning. And then I'm also curious if you, if you think that with this launch and with the continued development of commercial space flight, um, it will pave the way for private astronauts. Thank you. So how are we going to feel uh, tomorrow when we see OFT launch? I think in one word, really overwhelmed but in a good way and in, in really the best of ways. I think as we get closer to launch for personally me, my emotions are starting to get kind of pegged, you know, with this excitement and, and pride, uh, stress and, and really amazement at, at what we're doing and what we're accomplishing. So uh, tomorrow is a huge milestone for us and it's the, it's the next step prior to our launch on uh, CFT. So we are, are definitely looking forward to that. I think that as the administrator mentioned, this is really the new era of space flight. It's so incredible to be a part of that. And by this new era, what it's doing is it's opening up low Earth orbit. It's opening up space to not only just our government astronauts, but now commercial astronauts and more people on Earth that want access to space. We're talking about technology development. We're talking about science, but we're also talking about folks that can capture the amazement of space. So maybe teachers, maybe journalists, maybe artists that are able to 
gather everything that we see in space, the amazement of what we're doing, and they're able to translate that back to the people on Earth. And that's going to pay dividends and benefits, not only for inspiring the next generation, for helping us to understand as human race, as humankind, how we take care of our planet, how we interact with each other, and really where our future goes. So uh, I think it's the possibilities are, are just beginning, and it's incredible to be excited for that and for the launch tomorrow. Hi, Mary Liz Bender with Cosmic Perspective, and this is a just direct follow-on to that. Um, back in the day, Frank Borman said we should have sent poets when he came back from space. And you mentioning artists going into space to translate this to us here on Earth uh, has me wondering, how are you all preparing for supporting those people that have a lot less training than you? And uh, I've, I've heard that training program for private citizen astronauts is about two months. Can you talk about what that looks like? So, uh, yeah, so I'd, I'd like to share this answer quickly with uh, Chris Ferguson, but I flew with uh, uh, two different uh, um, private astronauts. Uh, they, they came up on uh, the Soyuz with us and, uh, and down with the Soyuz on us. And, uh, and, and if they're going to the International Space Station, uh, we have to treat, uh, share with them and, uh, and, and train them on how to be safe aboard the International Space Station. It's a national asset. It, and... Uh, and space, even though we make it look cool and fun, it's a little bit dangerous up there too. So we got to make sure that they're they're going to be safe and uh, help keep the rest of the, the crew safe. So we're going to teach them the the fundamentals of, uh, of of emergencies and things like that. You can almost think of it when you get on an airplane. They tell you how to close your seat buckle and where the nearest exits are. Uh, it's going to be like that, but in space and uh, and and a lot more. Uh, then we're also going to help ensure that their mission is successful, whether it's a mission to to share. Um, uh, uh, their feelings and uh, poetry in space, or whether they're up there to get uh, a serious uh, material science experiment done, uh, we're going to help ensure that they're successful. And we've done that, this in the past with uh, private space flight participants uh, flying up and down with Soyuzes. Now it's uh, we're going to uh, there's going to be a lot more, and there's a uh, and and with uh, companies like Boeing, they're going to be able to offer the seats and uh, get things done. Chris, anything to add? So I, I think most of you know that um, the Starliner is built to hold up to seven. It's currently configured for five, and uh, we have uh, a, a deal with NASA for four of those seats. So clearly we have uh, a lot of interest, and, uh, and there have been um, a fair amount of, uh, I think Colonel Cabana has signed up for at least one of those seats. I'm just hoping that on launch day he doesn't declare eminent domain. and and kick me out. But there are clearly opportunities that uh, I, I believe, as I had said earlier, uh, you know, when we build it, will they come? There will be plenty of opportunities for those. Now, uh, it, it, over time, safety will improve, costs will improve. And I really think that that is the long pole out there, is can we bring the cost of an orbital flight down to the realm at which perhaps um, somebody that is of moderate means can do it? We probably are a few years away from that. But we won't get there until we start. And what we're going to see tomorrow is the start. Just real quick, I feel like I have to answer your question because uh, even though I was a physicist in my previous, previous life, I think I'm the only one up here who went to a liberal, art, liberal arts uh, college. So of course, uh, arts and sciences together have a special place in my heart. Um, and I'll tell you, uh, in my life as a high energy physicist, um, there was a quote that always resonated with me, uh, both about science and especially about the arts. Um, the director of the uh, Fermi National Accelerator Lab, where I used to work, uh, was in front of Congress testifying at the height of the Cold War. And he was asked how what we do would help protect the country. And he paused for a moment and he said, it's not going to help at all, but it's going to make it a country worth protecting. And so. Um, I'm, I'm right with you. I, I love the science, and I love uh, everything else uh, that we've got available to us to help us appreciate why we do what we do. Sorry, I, I, I just want to weigh in on this as well, if that's all right, for just a second. Look, we have a history, um, not necessarily from the United States perspective, but we have, um, we, there, there have been commercial astronauts that have launched before. You just look at a, Anusha Ansari or Dennis Tito or Richard Garriott, like there, there is a precedence for this activity. In the United States, we've had experience launching members of Congress and senators. 
Um, so so there, there, is a, there is a way this can be done. But to, to, to the point, there's a couple of things. We need to make sure that there are people that want to go to space that are not NASA astronauts. That's why commercial crew is so important. We want to drive down the cost for the activities we need to do, which means we need industry. I like to talk about the industrialization of low Earth orbit. Industrialization is what we need to do, but you're talking about poets. That, they're important as well. What I would like to say, and I think this is even as, mu as much important, when you say poets, what I hear is pop culture. We need, we need space flight to be embedded in every part of the American culture because that's how we keep moving forward. That's how we encourage people um, and our members of Congress to continue investing in this activity. Um, but I'm also a big fan. Is it Mary Liz, is that your name? That's right. I'm also a big fan of sending, of sending journalists. So maybe there's an opportunity really, for you. Yeah. I'm small, I don't weigh very much. <laughs> and, and thank you so much for leading this program. You've been doing such a wonderful job. Thank, thank you. you. Great question. Hey everybody. My name is Mike Magnoli. I'm with Fox 35 News out of Orlando. My question is for the administrator and then one of the astronauts and the team can pick who will speak to this. How do you all feel about what Boeing is showing you when it comes to the capsule's rapid abort capability? And to you ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say thank you for your bravery and your willingness to do this. So when we talk about launch abort, that's, um, that's a challenge um, and it, al it always has been. Um, what's being different this being done differently this time is the idea um, that 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 your your, your normal um, systems are being incorporated into the launch abort system and so there's pressure differential as you go from a regular propulsion system to a launch abort capability and that has that has resulted in learning uh, not just for Boeing but also for SpaceX um, but at the end of the day it's going to result in a lot of efficiencies the the the, uh, the, the weight comes down the cost comes down. Um, and that's going to be good uh, for a competitive marketplace in the future when maybe our commercial partners are competing against international partners, for example, for these commercial activities. So it's an important capability. It's not easy to develop. I think both companies have learned that it's not easy to develop. But I'm, I'm confident that where we are is a good place. And we're going to learn a lot more, um, maybe not on the launch abort system, but on the parachute systems and other things as we go down the, go down the road here. Uh, before we get to our, our first flight. Remember why we test. We test because we need to learn. And when we learn, we fix and we move forward. That's the history of NASA. That's what we're going to continue to do. So in reference to the launch abort system, we, we have it, and that's good. You know, we have an ejection seat in jet aircraft, and we, we don't on a regular basis want to use that. We don't want to use the launch abort system either, but we have it. You know, one of our friends and colleagues not too long ago in uh, Kazakhstan actually had a launch abort or in-flight abort as you probably know and a couple hours later he was having tea with his cosmonaut colleague and then was able to come back and do it one more time and that's that's that comfort just that knowing that we have that escape system that we can count on and we can trust and you're right it's expensive and it's hard to put that on that type of spacecraft. But we need, we need that capability so we can bring our astronauts, our commercial partners, back home to their family and friends. And it's something that we truly believe in, and we're very happy that both Boeing and SpaceX have taken that seriously and understand that that's a capability that we need to have. So we're happy about it. Hi there, this is for the administrator. Uh, Rachel Joy with Florida Today. Um, so when I'm out speaking with our readers about Boeing, really the thing that's first and foremost on their mind, uh, especially now, is the 737 MAX tragedies, right? This is what's in the news every day. So as we're on the eve of this test um, about you know a spacecraft that will send humans to space, what does Boeing need to do to change that perception on, for this test? Yeah, so I, I do think in this particular case, um, it's really an apples to oranges comparison. Um, what we're doing here when we fly into space is very different than a, what a commercial airliner does day in and day out. Um, I will also say that we're very comfortable with Boeing as, as a company. Look at the history that Boeing has delivered on behalf of the United States of America. We look at the space shuttles, we look at the International Space Station. There's a lot of history here, there's a lot of capability here. Um, I am not going to suggest that this is easy, 
Um, but I will also tell you that NASA's engineers are embedded side by side with Boeing's engineers, that every piece of this um, of, of this spacecraft is being certified by NASA with, with the most talented and smart people in the nation, um, not just on their side, but also on the NASA side. Um, so I, I don't think that that's a fair comparison at all. Um, I would also say that if you look at Boeing as an institution, the people that develop spacecraft are not the same people that develop aircraft. Um, and this is not being, this is not an FAA certification kind of challenge. This, this is NASA. Um, saying to our commercial provider that we are certifying this as safe for flight. But we also have to remember, we're flying into space. <laughs> that, that is very, that's something very difficult to do. It's why we, that's why we take every precaution to make sure that it is as, as absolutely safe as possible. Why we have a launch abort system on this, which by the way, we didn't have during the shuttle era. In the shuttle era, there was no launch abort capability. Um, so this, th we, have, we have safety built into this that is far more robust than in the shuttle era, and I'm very comfortable with that. Okay, thank you. Hello, I'm Jackie Goddard for the Times of London. You've talked about the um, scientific value and the futuristic value of what you're going to be doing with Starliner. I wondered if any of you, the, of the astronauts, could talk about um, its meaning for future generations and how you get out there and talk to kids, maybe your kids or to kids that you go and meet in schools, and, and sell this to them as to why it's important for their future. Thank you. I think that's a very important question because I have a seven-year-old little boy, and um, and I tell you it's amazing each day to see the that sparkle in his eye. And at that age, it's when his the brain starts turning, right? They really start thinking. They're starting to develop logic. He has a lot of really good questions, and often in the morning, especially on the weekends, if I'm trying to get some sleep, he wakes up early and comes bounding down and says, "Mama." What are you going to do today? What's, what's happening with Starliner? Are you going to the Cape? Are you going to the moon? And he's, he's really excited. And, as, and I see that excitement in the kids on the street that we interact with every day, at the kids at his school. When we have the great opportunity to go and speak with school children, you can see that sparkle in their eye and that amazement. And that is important because at an early age, they are starting to think and they're starting to put it together. And they're really engaged in math in science and in the arts. The other day he was telling me a story about how they're building a bridge with these little popsicle sticks and it could hold paper and then it could hold a marble and he's proud of that. And so I think it's important for the next generation, for the younger generation to understand exactly what we're doing in space. The amazing things that our people can do as we come together, the ingenuity that we're seeing in the commercial industry. And so it's of the utmost important and it's great when we have the opportunity to reach out to the kids. Uh, I've also got two boys who happen to be uh, good friends of Jack's and so uh, they, uh, they uh, get into the Coke in the uh, fridge quite a bit and stay up till about 11 like they did uh, last Saturday together. Um, but I'll tell you, um, the thing that I get a lot from my boys, um, and I get it uh, in interviews as well, is what are we going to learn from this? Why, why are we doing this? And first of all, none of us do this on our own. Nobody goes to space on their own. Uh, the reason uh, that we're going here soon is because of the efforts of tens of thousands of people, uh, both today and in the past. And so to be a part of something in the future is just, it's, uh, as Nicole said, it's overwhelming. Uh, we're just uh, kind of a step uh, for the next generation. But what are we going to learn? The coolest thing, whether it's space exploration or fundamental science, we don't know what we're going to learn, and that's the coolest part of it. If we knew what we were going to learn, why would you go? And so it's, it's that, that ex, expeditionary process, it's that exploring that, that makes this all worthwhile and why we get up in the morning to do this job. Hey, just for the, uh, for the Florida team, and I know a lot of you uh, are here, um, Starliner was built right across the street here. I mean, from parts that came from all over the country. But the final assembly, everything was crafted by hand uh, over in the former, uh, one of the former orbiter processing buildings. And we are enormously proud of that. Um, I recall just a few short years after the end of the shuttle program, it was very quiet here. It was very quiet. I, uh, you know, I could almost imagine tumbleweeds blowing across some of the streets now Kennedy Space Center, Cape Canaveral is just vibrant. There's cars in every parking lot. Um, there are uh, 
there are voracious young men and women who want to learn about what we're doing here. I had an opportunity uh, while one of our test engineers was uh, at uh, covering our paddleboard test at White Sands a couple of months ago to go visit her daughter's high school right here, Maryland High School. And uh, it was just an incredible opportunity. It, it had been a while since I had done something like that. And uh, just the interest that these young men and women, because it's their mothers and fathers that work in this business, uh, they're engaged, they're interested, they're knowledgeable, they're excited. And uh, here we are, you know, again, right at the threshold of sending humans back from the Kennedy Space Center into, into orbit. And, uh, and they are fully engaged and aware, and, uh, and we're all looking forward to sort of impressing them uh, and, uh, and getting them into this wonderful space business that we have all made a career out of. And if we have no further questions, uh, we can go to final remarks. Well, it's uh, it's a, a it's just really an, an amazing time um, to be at this agency we call NASA, and it's a, a great time to be at the Kennedy Space Center with all the great work that's being done here, and of course, um, when we start launching into space, it's going to be a great time to be an American. <laughs> because we will launch American astronauts on American rockets from American soil. And I see you mouthing the words, because I'm going to keep saying it. It's overdue. Um, and this, this, so this is going to be a big, uh, a big day for, for us as we test the Boeing Starliner. Um, and I would also say um, that there's reasons we do this. We talked about the science. We talked about discovery. It's what we, what are we going to learn that we don't even know yet what to even ask? And, and, and that's really what these activities are, are all about. But think about this, and I see all the television cameras here. There's a lot of people that are going to watch this maybe using Dish Network or DirecTV. There's people that are going to watch this on the Internet. They're going to use maybe Internet broadband from space. These are communication capabilities that exist because of our exploration activities from the, from the 1950s and 1960s, even before we had human spaceflight. Um, but this is why we do these activities, because it benefits all of humanity. And it's not just communication, it's navigation. We think about the GPS constellation. It's how we produce food. It's how we produce energy in a more clean way. It's how we do um, disaster relief and national security. It's how we predict weather and how we understand climate. This little agency called NASA um, is less than one half of 1% of the federal budget. And yet, if you look at what we have delivered, not just for the United States of America, but for all of humanity, this is why it is worth the investment. It has returned far, far more than anybody can even measure at this point, and far more than our Apollo astronauts could imagine. And when we start launching commercial crew, I think that it's going to deliver far more than even what we've already seen uh, that has resulted from this little investment that we call NASA. So, uh, tomorrow is a big day. It's the, the first step in this next venture uh, for commercial crew, especially the Starliner, and we're looking forward to a very successful launch. Um, and I also want to say one last thing as I have my closing remarks here. Uh, we cannot also dismiss the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket. This has been a workhorse for the United States of America for, for many, many years, well over 100 successful launches at this point. Um, and, and United Launch Alliance is, is, is another great partner in this activity. So make sure um, as you tell your stories that you're talking about the great work that they are doing as well. So thank you for being here at the press conference, and we'll look forward to the next pre press conference. Thank you.